Today we have uh, Dr. Josna. Uh, Dr. Josna has completed her uh, MD in palliative medicine from Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai. And she's currently the assistant professor in the Department of Palliative Medicine at CMC uh, Vello. And uh, she, uh, her areas of interest are mostly clinical research methodologies in palliative care. And uh, I understand, Jolsna, you recently received uh, an award too for the best outgoing student from PMH, I guess. Thank you so much for agreeing uh, to be a part of our program. Uh, uh, has she joined, right? I, I, can't, I can't see Dr. Jolsna. Uh, yes, she has joined. Okay. Thank you, Jolsna. And it's nice to see you here in this platform through Pali India as a faculty for our session. Over to you. Uh, hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah, I'm so sorry for there. There will be some background disturbance going on. I am not able to do anything about it. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, am I audible clearly, ma'am? Uh, yes, yes, your voice is clear. Okay. Uh, very good afternoon, everyone. I yes, I thank. Uh, Kalyan India, Dr. Sritavi ma'am and all the organizers of this uh, program for giving me this opportunity uh, to learn and discuss about a few palliative care emergencies that we commonly come across. So, can I share the screen now? Yes, ma'am. Access is already there. Is my screen visible to everyone? Yes, ma'am. Screen is visible. Perfect. Good to go. Uh, in case I'm not audible or if, if, if there's any problem with the screen, please let me know. So, uh, I'll start. So uh, once again, uh, so today's uh, discussion is on palliative care emergencies. So as a resident, when I was a resident in palliative medicine, that it was a usual question that I used to get from my colleagues who were working in other departments in other hospitals. When I, when I used to tell them about uh, doing casualty duties and night on calls, they were always wondering what a palliative medicine resident is doing inside the casualty. So let's see, uh, so this is a very uh, brief discussion uh, because of the time constraints, we are not able to cover the entire, uh, all the points about each of the topics. So as you all know, medical emergencies are situations during which a patient's life, quality of life, as well as life is threatened and uh, if no intervention is done, it can lead to the death of the patient or a decrease in quality of life. Meanwhile, palliative care emergencies are those medical emergencies that occur in patients with incurable diseases that may lead to death or decrease quality of life. So coming to somewhere which is beyond these definitions. So what is different about managing an emergency in palliative care? So when you are a, uh, when you are a palliative medicine physician, when you are managing an emergency, you always have to keep the patient's clinical context in your mind more than what even happens. So there are some points that uh, you should keep in your mind when you make decisions regarding the management of palliative care emergencies. So we, we should have an overall idea about the natural history of the patient's disease, the prognosis of the disease, patient's performance status, patient's wishes, preferences, as well as the family's concerns. Also, when you are choosing a particular treatment, whether the benefits outweigh the risks or what are the likely outcomes that would come out of it. Another point when you are a palliative medicine physician is that most palliative care emergencies can be anticipated and treated with preemptive elective interventions. So whenever an intervention is inappropriate, sensitive conversations, discussions with the patient, his or her family and the staff of what would lie ahead 
can avoid the stress of unexpected developments and the need for urgent clinical decisions. So always keep in mind the clinical context. Second point is anticipate an emergency and prepare the family and the patient through a very systematic and very empathetic uh, conversations where uh, this is where the importance of early palliative care concept lies. So uh, there are a lot of emergencies that uh, occur in uh, the field of palliative medicine. So here we will be focusing on only on, in an on, only on the oncological setting and also I will be covering only the management in adult patients. So pediatric patients and non-oncological settings are uh, out of scope of this uh, session. So palliative care emergencies uh, can be either neurological, GI, vascular, renal, metabolic emergencies, respiratory emergencies, hematological emergencies or infections or musculoskeletal emergencies like fractures. So within the next half an hour, we'll be having a brief overview of uh, three of these emergencies, which are malignant spinal cord compression, SVC obstruction, and hemorrhage. So um, we have a case, and just imagine uh, you are the palliative medicine uh, resident or a doctor on call. So you are getting a call for this patient from casualty. So here is a 54-year-old male patient who is a non-case of prostate cancer. He was uh, diagnosed last year. He has come with history of nine weeks of progressively worsening upper back pain and three days history of weakness in lower extremities and difficulty in walking. So uh, if you can put in chat, what will be the first thing in an oncological setting that will come to your mind when you see this patient? No, the, the diagnosis. It's all the non-case of malignancy. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, vertebral next compressing nerve. Yeah. So here we are uh, looking at malignant spinal cord compression. So this is one point I want to reiterate. So in patients with cancer, new onset back pain with or without neurological deficits must be considered spine metastasis and potential malignant spinal cord compression until proven otherwise. So we we'll just uh, briefly go through the uh, causes and the pathophysiology a bit. So as we all know, uh, the vertebral column is involved by metastatic tumor in around 40% of the patients who die of cancer. And 10% of patients with spine metastasis will develop malignant spinal cord compression. Among the uh, entire vertebral column, so thoracic spine, because of its natural kyphotic curvature and also because it occupies most of the intrathecal cross section. So it is the most common type. In 70% of the cases, it is a thoracic spine which is involved. 20% uh, of the cases have involvement of the lumbar vertebrae and 10% of the cases will have involvement of the cervical spine. And in one third of the patients, they will present with metastasis at multiple vertebral levels. So the most common malignancies uh, present in with spinal meds include breast cancer, lung and prostate cancer. Others include renal cell carcinoma, lymphoma and myeloma. So uh, uh, coming to the mechanism uh, uh, and the pathophysiology of MSCC, so in most of the cases, the most common cause is a hematogenous spread. So uh, especially of tumor cells which have a specific affinity for the spinal marrow. So through a hematogenous spread, they reach the vertebral body and there it grows, develops as a mass and impinges on the fecal sac which is lying anteriorly leading to spinal cord compression and also uh, compression or pressure over the epidural venous plexus. So a direct tumor extension from the osseous vertebral column, this is the most common uh, mechanism implicated in MSCC. So other mechanisms implicated include a direct invasion of a paravertebral mass through the intervertebral foramina, retrograde venous spread uh, like via the Bateson's uh, venous plexus, 
uh, from uh, abdominal and pelvic malignancies. Also, it could be a pathological fracture. So what exactly happened? So uh, this is a paper by uh, Prasad et al. This is, a, this is a very old paper, but they have beautifully described the pathophysiology of uh, malignant spinal cord compression in that. So uh, the basic mechanism is vasogenic edema, which is caused by uh, so whenever there's a tumor causing uh, there's, an, there's a compression or the epidural venous plexus. So this leads to the release of inflammatory mediators like interleukins and prostaglandins. Uh, so this in effect leads to vasogenic edema. There is ischemia and neurological deficits. And depending upon the histology of the tumor, sensitivity of the tumor to treatments and the time duration of treatments, some people recover. In, in, in uh, the ischemia also leads to release of some amino acids and this further leads to cytotoxic edema leading to calcium channels opening up and a permanent neurological damage. So understanding the mechanism and pathophysiology is important because we need to target, we need to know the mechanism faction of each of the drugs that we give in MSEC. Another factor which is implicated is vascular endothelial growth factor, which also causes increases the hypoxia and the necrosis. So uh, the usual typical history is uh, history of back pain in about 70% to 96% of patients. This is, the this is the most common complaint uh, that the patient will have. Other, uh, so the typical characteristics of the pain include, so it's a progressive, severe, unremitting spinal pain, which on in the supine position more during the night and impacting the sleep of the patient. And the pain, uh, as the, uh, during the progressive uh, compression, the, the, the patients get the pain associated with the adjacent nerve root and hence they complain of pain aggravation on activity, coughing, sneezing or any other activity that causes straining. So the most important point to consider is that the pain usually presents for several weeks before neurological signs appear. So second most common symptom is weakness. So 61% to 91% patients present with motor weakness. Uh, some people have sensory loss and bowel and bladder are involved in uh, and autonomic symptoms are present in around 40% to 75% of patients. Now, swift diagnosis and appropriate management, you can help minimize the disability that is uh, bound to happen. So 50% of patients with uh, malignant spinal cord compression, they're unable to walk by the time of diagnosis. And 67%, they regain no function after one month. So uh, we'll see that later also we'll see that the pre-treatment -ampl pre ambulatory status, that is the most important prognostic factor for uh, regaining ambulatory function post-treatment. So now you have taken a proper history of the patient. So you move to the examination, you do a thorough CNS examination, check the strength, check the power, the reflexes, the tone. Then if uh, you are able to locate the sensory level and also uh, to know whether bladder is involved, to palpate the abdomen, to know whether there is a, a, a bowel involvement, you examine for the rectal tone, look for the spinal tenderness, and come to the localization of the lesion neurologically. I've not uh, included the localization of the lesion here because of the time constraints. So the, uh, another important point to note is that these signs can be very subtle, and the absence of these physical signs do not exclude significant spinal cord compression. So how do we investigate this? So usually the gold standard investigation of choice is MRI whole spine. Why whole spine? Because as we saw earlier, around one third of the patients, they will present with multiple uh, vertebral spinal involvement. And also sometimes the clinical uh, localization may not be actually indicative of or correlating with the uh, actual problem. So MRI has a 93% sensitivity and 97% specificity. And how soon should we get the MRI done? So within 24 hours, 
in case of a spinal pain, spinal pain, which is suggestive of spinal meds and cord compression, and occasionally sooner if there is a need for emergency surgery. So this is according to the nice guidance. And uh, in case MRI is contraindicated, suppose patient has a pacemaker or um, in such settings, they have mentioned CT myelogram can be considered. However, according to the nice guidance uh, in UK, so they suggest that if MRI is not available within 24 hours or uh, as soon as possible, you should refer the patient to a center with 24 hour MRI services. So this is an image, a radiological image. Uh, this is a T2 selective section of the uh, MRI showing uh, compression at, at this T5 level. So now coming to the management. So prompt management will reduce sequelae. So this is a stepwise uh, management algorithm. So always the first step is to make sure that in an oncological setting or if it's not, it's a not, if it's a not, a, if it's not a non-case of malignancy and somebody is upfront presenting with malignancy with, with the spinal cord compression, you need to establish a histological diagnosis first. So get the tissue removed for biopsy and before waiting for the reports, like all guidelines recommend that you can initiate steroids, that's a step two. Step three, you should evaluate the life expectancy, performance status, extent of the disease and the available systemic treatment options and their feasibility. And in Step four, uh, we'll see some management algorithms for managing MSCC. So uh, what is the exact mechanism of corticosteroids? They actually downregulate the production of uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, prostaglandin E2. Hence, they decrease the spinal cord edema and delay the onset of neurological decline. So uh, the steroid of choice that we use is dexamethasone uh, because it has the least uh, medulla corticoid action and optimal dosing so there is no high quality evidence showing that this dosing is optimal in initiating in, in the initiation of corticosteroids in the case of spinal cord compression so if we look briefly through the evidences regarding the dose of dexa so um, in the pilot study they compared 96 milligram that is high dose dexa with the 16 m milligram for three days and then tapering dose they did not find any significant difference in the functional outcomes at one month time point in 2015, a Cochrane review concluded that, so giving a high dose dexa as an initial bolus carried the disadvantage of serious adverse effects in patients with cord compression. And whether high dosing provides an additional benefit over moderate dosing, that is 10 to 16 milligram uh, bolus dosing is unclear. So uh, according to settings, uh, this initial bolus dose differed. So the US guidelines and in, in some of the Indian, Indian settings, uh, we give 10 milligram IV bolus followed by uh, four to six milligram IV every six hourly. But uh, the UK guidelines are uh, still continuing with 16 milligram IV bolus followed by uh, four to six milligram IV every six hours. Usually it is tapered over uh, two weeks as tolerated, usually after the completion of radiotherapy. Now, uh, this is the this is one of the algorithms that uh, we can uh, that will help us in guiding uh, whom to refer to what is the ideal ideal treatment that is uh, that suits this patient so so first you assess the performance status of the patient if it is a very poor uh, performance status like less than 40 and if the expected life expectancy is less than two months usually a short course radiation is given or if uh, that is also not feasible consider the patient for best supportive care but in patients with fair or good very good uh, performance status and patients who have a life expectancy of more than two months you consider the systemic burden of the disease so if it's a minimal or moderate disease uh, disease status and you use you, you go for you find out whether effective systemic treatments are available and then you go forward to the algorithm. If it's an extensive disease which is extensive and uncontrolled and progressing and uh, no effective systemic treatment options are available, you go for a short course radiation or best supportive care. In other, in the rest of the cohort, so M and OP, M stands for mechanical, so you always assess whether uh, using the image uh, and using a separate algorithm, you see whether the spine is stable or unstable. 
so in case of an unstable or unstable spine always go for the uh, spine stabilization surgery once you stabilize the spine or in patients whose uh, spine is stable uh, see the extent of the cord compression that we'll cover in the next slide and then you come to the uh, oncological uh, biology of the tumor whether it's a radio responsive tumor or a radio resistant tumor if it's a favorable histology you go for conventional ebrt if it's intermediate you go for either a conventional ebrt or a separation surgery followed by uh, conventional ebrt or sprt and if it's an unfavorable histology you go for a separation surgery followed by sprt sorry <coughs> so uh, to assess for the stability of the spine, you uh, usually use a scoring system called as SINS. Just a second, sorry. So, uh, you take into consideration the location of the lesion, the pain, uh, the nature of the lesion, of lesion, whether it's a lytic lesion or a blastic lesion. And by the rate, uh, you look at the radiographic alignment of the uh, spine, see for vertebral body collapse, involvement of posterolateral spinal elements, and if the score is more than 12, it's an unstable spine, and you refer the patient immediately to a neurosurgery. <coughs> if it's a uh, if it's a stable spine, then you uh, decide according to the radio responsiveness of the tumor. And the, whether it's a low-grade or a high-grade spinal cord compression, you assess from an MRI. So uh, if, it is a, if it is grade 2 or 3, it's a high-grade myelopathy, high-grade cord compression. And if it is less than that, it's a low-grade cord compression. So this is another algorithm which is called as a norms framework. This is almost, um, these are the same, um, same guidelines for management. So, um, so radiotherapy options, uh, you can either go for a conventional EBRT or an SPRT depending upon the prognosis of the patient. So uh, usually you have to refer to the radiation oncologist, you start the steroids and refer the patient to a radiation oncologist. And it should be started, initiated within 24 hours and in patients who are not suitable for imminent surgery. So there are trials which shows that uh, in patients who have a very short prognosis, like less than, in less than three months, a single fraction eight of eight gray uh, is non inferior to 20 gray in five fractions. So in patients who have a good prognosis, uh, options like uh, stereotactic body radiation is considered. So when, uh, what are the indications of a surgery in these patients? So uh, spinal instability, when there is an intraspinal bony fragment, or if it is a patient who has a tumor growth even after radiotherapy, dislocated fractures of the spine. So these are some of the indications of uh, for uh, referring to a surgery, surgery unit. And when should, we, when should the surgery be done or when should we refer? So before they lose the ability to go. So once they become completely paraplegic or tetraplegic and 24 hours, more than 24 hours has passed, only if, a, uh, if the spine is unstable, surgery has a role. So uh, apart from all these things, we have to manage the pain. We can use opioids, non-opioids, adjuvants, consider bisphosphonates for preventing further uh, skeletal related events. Um, adequate bowel and bladder regimen has to be given. Uh, rehabilitation has to be done. So once you transition out of the acute care setting, you have to address the other, all these things as well as address the psychosocial concerns of the patient and the family. And prognosis of these patients are generally around five months, and it depends upon the functional status and the type of cancer. So, uh, so post-treatment ambulatory status, it is usually dependent upon the ambulatory status before treatment, interval from symptom to treatment, and time to development of motor deficits. And these are some of the tools which will help us in prognosticating patients with MSCC and not going into the details of these. So, uh, there is another imminent emergency that can occur in a patient with, who has already presented with, uh, to you with the malignant spinal cord compression. So this is the case. 
Uh, so we, here we have a 53 year old male patient who is a non case of lung cancer, recent onset uh, MSCC at T3 level. He has presented to the emergency with severe headache, profuse sweating of the forehead and chest, and redness of his face. Uh, um, on a history, uh, you are getting that he has not passed even for the last six hours. Examination, vitals, his BP is 200 uh, upon 100, his pulse rate is 54, and he is paraplegic and he has a palpable bladder. So can anybody tell me what is happening here? What is the emergency that we are looking at here? You can put it in the chat. <coughs> there are a few responses in the chat. Uh, Jutsna, are you able to uh, read the chat because you're presenting from your side or should I read it for you? Uh, yes, ma'am, I can see the chat. Okay. Anything else? Uh, SVCO, we are coming to that. So his BP is 200 by 100. His, he has a bradycardia. He has a palpable bladder. He is sweating like anything. He has other pointers, if I can give. He has uh, pyloerection, autonomic symptoms. So here we, we are looking upon something called as autonomic dysreflexia. So this is an emergency that we should never miss in a patient with, uh, with a spinal cord injury or cord compression. This is uh, especially seen in patients with spinal cord injury above the level of T6. So the main trigger is any noxious or painful stimulus below the level of injury. It can be a full bladder, it can be a full bowel, any, any distended hollow viscera, it can be even a pressure sore or a tight clothing. So what happens exactly, I'm just going through it very briefly because of the lack of time. So whenever there's a painful stimulus, uh, there will be the activation of the autonomic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system becomes activated and this leads to increase in blood pressure. The parasympathetic system will try to compensate and there is bradycardia and vasodilatation. However, the uh, parasympathetic signals that are coming down, they are blocked at the level of injury. This leads to severe vasoconstriction of the splanchnic and the visceral uh, sympathetic autonomic nervous system, leading to potentially dangerous hypertension. So if you do not recognize it and remove the trigger immediately, it can be actually life-threatening. So the management is very simple. You have to identify this emergency, locate and remove the trigger or stimulus. If it's a full bladder, you catheterize the patient. If it's a full bowel, you evacuate the bowel. If it's a pressure injury, you address the same. If the patient has a tourniquet or a tight clothing, you just remove the tight clothing. You sit the patient up. Then, so first you remove the trigger or the stimulus that is causing the uh, causing the problem, and then you go on to uh, address the uh, go on to lower the blood pressure. So the most important take home message from this is that in a patient with cord compression, you have to reinforce regular bowel and bladder care, prevent pressure injuries as, as much as possible, and avoid tight clothing. So you can read in detail about this emergency, but always I, I cannot, uh, I am not able to explain it in a fully detailed way because of the lack of time. So, but this is an emergency within an emergency that you should never miss. So this is the, uh, coming to the second case scenario. Uh, so this is a 59 year old female patient she is a non-case of uh, carcinoma of tongue with, uh, with cervical nodal involvement. She had a large ulcerative lesion in the neck. So she is enrolled for a hospice program. And suddenly uh, she, de she developed a brisk bleeding from the lesion and she is very anxious as is her daughter. So here it is very straightforward. We are uh, looking at a case of hemorrhage. So, Incidence of significant bleeding in advanced cancer, it's about 6%, 14%. And the most common sites of uh, bleeding include carotid, femoral, and intrapulmonary vessels. So as, as, I mean, as we can all understand, it's a very distressing symptom for patients, carers, and healthcare professionals. So bleeding or a hemorrhage uh, can have multiple etiologies. It can be uh, caused due to a local problem, especially in uh, tumors which are 
located very close to major major arteries, major blood vessels like head and neck malignancies, lung cancer, GI cancers, um, colorectal uh, malignancies, and gynec malignancies. So direct infiltration of the tumor into the vessel can uh, result in a catastrophic bleed. So uh, whenever there is a visible pulsation or a sudden increase in pain in a patient with a malignant fungating wound, you should uh, reassess the patient and anticipate this problem if possible. Even a poor wound healing or development of an infection within the tumor cavity will increase the risk of bleeding. There can be other causes as well, like treatment related causes. It can be myelosuppression from chemo or radiation uh, because of some uh, vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitors such as bevacizumab or sunitinib. And it can even be due to a local inflammation around the surgical site or a uh, site which has received radiation prior. Even a patient who has uh, had a radical neck, neck dissection before, or if the patient is on NSAIDs uh, or anticoagulants, so all these are risk factors. Uh, and though in though and in these patients, you have to always keep the possibility of a hemorrhage in mind. It can also be due directly related to malignancies, uh, which involve the bone marrow, uh, like leukemia and lymphoma. Or it can be systemic causes. So in patients who have a chronic liver disease, biliary obstruction, or with a malabsorption that results from small bowel resection, uh, clotting factors can be deficient and resulting in bleeding. Or it can be a uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation due to any, any cause. So that's a general algorithm to assess a patient presenting with bleeding in palliative care setting. So first, exam first you see for the site of bleeding. So if it's an external bleed or an internal bleed, external bleeding, you apply a dressing immediately to apply pressure and protect the bone from further trauma and infection. Second, you assess how large is the bleed. You uh, examine the patient, check the vitals, take the pulse. Uh, uh, also, keep in mind the possibility of a postural hypotension. Uh, take full blood count, uh, take samples for cross matching, coagulation profile, also uh, uh, send uh, urea and electrolytes because in GI bleeds uh, there can be uh, elevated urea levels. Uh, secure IV access, give fluid resuscitation uh, depending upon the volume loss. And what, and is it a massive catastrophic bleed or a terminal hemorrhage that we will see later? The third point is is it a lot a reversible cause? Is there a reversible cause, local or systemic? Review any drugs which could be the uh, etiology here. If it's a multiple, if the patient is bleeding from multiple sites, always uh, keep in mind the possibility of an underlying coagulopathy. And in case of an infection, send for swabs or cultures. Fourthly, uh, just see for immediate local measures that can be used. And also, in the palliative, palliative care setting, you have to determine the most appropriate place of care for the patient, both at that time point and in the event of any further deterioration. Also ensure that a proper management plan in, uh, for bleeding is documented and communicated to all staff as well as the family. So ge in general, uh, the management, apart from having a clear plan and uh, documentation of the uh, place of care, preferred place of care, uh, usual management of bleeding includes applying pressure, packing with uh, tranexamic acid or epinephrine soft pads. Uh, interventions include um, embolization, surgical ligation, and radiotherapy uh, if it is a correctable cause or, uh, or for clotting factors. You can supplement clotting factors, blood and plastic products, depending upon the setting and the etiology of the bleed. So uh, when you are giving tranexamic acid, just you have to exercise caution if it is a patient who has hematuria because uh, it has the potential to cause microthrombi. This can lead to uh, urinary retention uh, and obstruction and even hydronephrosis. So uh, in such cases, uh, and if pa the patient's platelet le levels are normal, ethamsylate is, uh, is an alternative option because it, it enhances, increases the placid abusiveness and thus it controls the bleeding. And uh, if it's a, if it's a uh, as per the site, the management will vary according to the site of the bleed. So if it's a hematuria, if the patient is presenting with a hematuria, uh, you have to give valvification uh, and uh, do the supportive measures. And there are reports about 
insulation of alum irrigation with bladder irrigation of bladder with uh, even alum uh, which can, which have actually stopped hematuria i did not have a personal experience with that but uh, the hematises uh, you again uh, you use that of systemic tannic acid and if the patient struggles to school or if it is feasible uh, refer to interventional radiologist for a bronchial artery embolization if it is a gi bleed again apart from the interventions you can give proton pump inhibitors um and or sucralfate or a octreotide or vasopressin and lox so i'm not going to the uh, management of each uh, management of the bleeding in each of the sites uh, here so just one thing uh, so there is this this is a very life threatening and very distressing condition which is what is called carotid blood syndrome so there are three types uh, in type 1 it's a threatened carotid blood syndrome here the carotid artery is exposed because of the soft tissue breakdown but there is no bleeding so in type 2 it is impending type here the artery is exposed and limited sentinel bleed is there an active cbs active carotid blood syndrome is a very distressing condition where there is active carotid rupture and active hemorrhage so uh, coming to terminal hemorrhage uh, and the management of the same so uh, harris and noble in 2009 in their paper Uh, this is a very good paper for studying terminal hemorrhage. So they have defined it as a major any major hemorrhage which results in the death of the patient within a period of time that may be as short as minutes due to rapid internal or external loss of circulating blood volume. Other definitions include the loss of uh, about more than 1.5 liters of blood in 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 an around uh, 30 seconds of duration, and when no treatment options are available. so that is also an alternative definition however there is very uh, less research in the uh, that has focused on the management of the same so we cannot uh, emphasize that this particular intervention or this methodology or this way of management is very good or proper because it is very difficult to do research in this setting as well another difficulty is at the onset of bleeding to know whether it will be terminal or not that is also a conundrum so supportive strategies which are mentioned include so as a physician or uh, the, you have the primary point is that you have to stay with the patient during uh, an episode of massive hemorrhage because it's a very distressing condition and you are going away to take the medicines or getting the equipments so that can aggravate the distress of the patient so the most important point is stay with the patient at all times then as we all know uh, we can use uh, dark towels and dark colored bed sheets to camouflage the extent of blood loss so that the patient's distress does not get aggravated on seeing the extent of blood loss again use of personal protective equipment plastic sheets uh, use of uh, socket pads uh, and clinical waste pad waste pads so all these are uh, additive and always in patients who are at risk of Um, such an episode always anticipate the crisis always teach the family about the crisis plan teach the patient and family about the crisis plan before it happens that is the most important responsibility as a palliative medicine physician so these conversations are difficult obviously they are very difficult so you have to uh, you might have to uh, do it in multiple sessions through uh, very sensitive uh, serious illness conversations pharmacological measures uh, include sedatives to alleviate distress so benzodiazepines especially uh, short acting rapid acting benzodiazepine like uh, midazolam so the dose is given as 5 mg to 10 mg parenterally uh, it also has the ability to cause uh, retrograde amnesia so that also helps in such a distressing condition so other medications include strong strong opioids and ketamine so uh, the routes where uh, the routes which are preferred include Uh, routes where the action will be very rapid, so it can be either intramuscular, buccal, or intravenous. Subcutaneous uh, route is less preferred because already there is very poor perfusion to the skin because of the blood loss and uh, poor circulatory volume. Apart from all these measures, uh, management and witnessing of such an event is um, highly distressing one. So always remember to support the relatives, be brief after the event, and also. And uh, also uh, remember to 
uh, debrief with your healthcare team as well. So uh, we'll just cover the last emergency that we have to deal with uh, today. This is a 67 year old male with uh, small cell lung cancer. He is presenting to the ER with uh, complaints of swelling of face and neck, cough, hoarseness of voice and dyspnea. So this is a very straightforward uh, case. So superior vena cava syndrome uh, is defined as obstruction of blood flow through the superior vena cava. So this in this diagram we can see the clinical signs and the collaterals that develop because of the obstruction. So the patient will, as our patient presented, uh, so the patient will present with edema of the face, neck, upper chest, uh, there are visible and goes jugular veins. So whenever there's a tumor or any, anything that causes a compression of uh, this SVC, either extrinsically or intrinsically. So it can be a tumor or a mass or anything that comes with SVC from outside, or it can be anything intrinsic, such as a tumor thrombus or a catheter induced thrombus that develops intrinsically. So whenever there's an obstruction of the uh, superior vena cava, what happens is that uh, in order to compensate, collaterals will develop. So we'll see that in the coming slides. So uh, the most common cancers uh, where SVC obstruction is seen include uh, small cell lung cancer and squamous cell carcinoma in case of uh, lung, any lymphomas with the uh, involvement, and uh, other malignancies like germ cell tumors and thymomas, again, uh, they present with medicinal masses. And uh, in some cases of uh, metastatic breast cancers, they have reported uh, the uh, incidence of SVCO. Non neoplastic causes include a central, the most common cause uh, in non neoplastic category include uh, central, central uh, venous catheter thrombosis, again, other vascular anomalies and aneurysms, or, or even in uh, Diseases such as basic disease. In pediatric population, uh, usually it is iatrogenic because of uh, necessity catheter for parental nutrition. Um, other conditions include again iatrogenic causes like post -cardio cardiovascular surgery or an orthotopic heart transplant. So uh, these are the common symptoms and physical findings that um, happen in patients with uh, superior vena cava obstruction. So dyspnea is the most uh, prevalent symptom followed by facial swelling and head fullness. Other symptoms include cough, swelling of the um, chest pain and dysphagia. Physical findings, uh, because of the collaterals, uh, you can see distended veins throughout the chest wall, neck. With the venous condition, uh, you can uh, see the patient present in view with facial edema, cyanosis, plethora. So, uh, we just, uh, so there, is, there are so many classifications for SVCO. So this is an anatomical, anatomical classification, Dotty and Sanford classification. This is based on the uh, level of obstruction. So whether it's a supra azygos uh, obstruction or if, if the azygos system is completely involved. So uh, depending upon the level and site of obstruction, the, the collaterals that form will vary. So there is another classification, this is uh, use classification. This is completely clinical. Uh, it ranges from grade 0, which is asymptomatic, to grade 4, which is life-threatening with significant cerebral and laryngeal edema and even cardiac failure. So this is uh, this classification is, will help us in uh, managing the patient uh, in a systematic manner. Uh, there is also, for uh, considering the surgical risk, there is something called Bixby's classification, where uh, it is divided into low risk and high risk depending upon the symptoms of the patient. So, diagnostic workup. Uh, so, uh, the most important point uh, to note that not is that so treatment of HPCO is uh, disease specific right from the outset. So, a complete workup of pathological diagnosis is uh, prior to the start of treatment is uh, mandatory. So, chest X ray features suggestive of a superior mediastinal widening or pure location might be seen. But uh, contrast enhanced uh, CT scan will give us a detailed information about the SVC, the tributaries, and the surrounding structures. Also, uh, pathological confirmation uh, is necessary uh, if it is not a non case of uh, malignancy. So, the management, gentle management measures include uh, raising the head end of the bed uh, so that venous condition is well to be reduced, 
if there is hypoxia, provide oxygen, manage the airway. So uh, for supportive management, uh, uh, it is a common practice to use steroids, like up to 15 milligram per day. However, uh, this does not have a high quality evidence. So most of the studies are observational and some are case code. So we do not have a high quality evidence that steroids definitely help in management. As is diuretics. And for prophylactic anticoagulation, sorry, that's the right thing error. Um, there is no benefit for a prophylactic anticoagulation in the absence of a proven thrombus. So management, management is mostly disease specific. If it's a small cell lung cancer, usually platinum based chemotherapy with or without radiotherapy. And if it's an NSCLC, um, again radiotherapy is preferred. And lymphoma is response to chemotherapy and uh, followed by local consolidation with RT. If it's a catheter induced thrombus, then removal of the catheter and uh, implementation of anticoagulation measures will help. So the average survival rate has been reported as nine years for benign causes, while it is only about five months for patients with lung cancer as the cause of SBC. So, <coughs> sorry. Treatment options again, so if it's a palliative radiation, the goal is to decrease the extrinsic pressure by the node or the tumor um, which is compressing the SPC. And uh, palliative radiation will en encompass all the gross disease that is responsible for the same. But the effective initial treatment for uh, patients who are uh, imminently dying or very severe life threatening uh, patients who have laryngeal edema, cerebral edema, the immediate effective treatment is urgent uh, standing, standing and antiplastic. In patients uh, who are young, fit, who have uh, non metastatic, non lymphomatous diagnosis of uh, malignancy, SVC reconstruction can be considered. <coughs> so, this is a algorithm management algorithm for the same. So, first, uh, you have to take a clinical history, examine the patient, do an imaging, investigate for brain metastasis. What is the airway status? Is there any cardiac uh, compensation? So we have earlier we have seen this grading, clinical grading. So if it's grade one, two, and three symptoms, to so go forward with the disease specific management plan. If it's a grade four, uh, that is patient who has uh, life threatening laryngeal edema, cerebral edema, etc. Urgent stenting is recommended. I'm so sorry for. Um, going over over time so thank you so much for uh, your patient listening uh, any questions or comments thank you uh, Josna, for uh, the detailed presentation on the common uh, emergencies that we face we'll wait for the chat for two minutes probably if there are any questions or anyone can unmute and ask questions if you have any doubts Dr. Josna, please show your last slide algorithm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. There is a question by Dr. Parul. Uh, she's asking what is the most commonly faced emergency in your setting? What is the one you have come across most common? The most common emergency that I have had is definitely it is malignant spinal cord compression. Uh, that, yeah, malignant spinal cord compression is the most common emergency that I've come across. Almost, uh, but yeah. Yeah, I think same uh, from our side too. I think uh, we have come across malignant spinal cord compression the most. As she mentioned in the presentation, they come up with the 
onset of pain for a few days before the other neurological symptoms. So it is very important to identify all these emergencies. It's very important to identify as soon as they present and send it for management or then it comes reversible. Uh, Sripri, I think we can go on to the case presentation and then take a few questions after that. Sure. Dr. Devashish? Yeah. Am I, am I audible? Yes, Hello. sir. You are audible. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I am Dr. Devashish Das, acting as a uh, radiation oncologist at Medical College, Kolkata. Uh, today's presentation is about SVCO. Uh, we have a patient, a female patient, aged of about 62 years. And it is a diagnosed case of stage four lung cancer, presenting with the involvement of the right first and second rib, as well as the impending SVCO. Patient has a complaint uh, lasting for the last six months. There is progressively increasing pain over right shoulder and the right upper chest wall. And of late, uh, she had uh, gradually increasing respiratory distress that is more on lying down as well as on stooping forward. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, the patient is a uh, uh, resident of rural Bengal at least 400 kilometers away from the metro city of Kolkata. So uh, uh, she first had an attack of uh, chronic cough along with occasional respiratory distress for the last six months. And for, followed by, uh, for the last two months, she had pain on right upper chest and the right shoulder. And for the last one month, she had pain on right hypochondriate region. And for the uh, six months ago, for uh, her uh, initial complaints, she attended the local quack. When her uh, complaints did not subside, she attended the local BPSC four months ago, where the chest X-ray was taken, which, so, uh, which shows the uh, upper right lung mass, and she was immediately referred to the district hospital. Now, at the Shadar Hospital, the FNSC was taken from the lung as well. And that was suggestive of CA lung favoring NSCLC. And then the, this patient was referred to our institution to the department of chest. Now at the chest department, the metastatic workup was done in the form of CCD chest and abdomen. That where it comes out to be liver secondary along with the bone involvement, which was previously seen in the CCD chest as well as in the chest X-ray. Now, during this time, Patient has also developed increasing pain over right upper chest, shoulder, radiating to the shoulder, as well as increasing respiratory distress. And at this point, she was referred to our department of radiotherapy. Next slide, please. Now, when we first examined the patient, she was conscious, cooperative, oriented, but with very, very anxious look. And she was presented in the propped up position difficulty in lying down uh, as well as in stooping forward. And on examination, there was puffiness of face uh, with upper chest wall venous prominence. And there was on palpation, there was uh, definitive local tenderness of uh, right upper chest, including the secondary. Next slide, please. And uh, the investigation uh, shows uh, among the uh, prominent ones, uh, there was uh, slight anemia as well as the raised liver engines. And metastatic workup was already done at chest, which shows that it is a case of NSCLC with liver and bone involvement, presenting now with pain upper chest due to rib as well as the chest wall involvement. And that was not relieved by the first line analgesics. And along with this, uh, with this there is impending SVCO. And so far as treatment is concerned, uh, she was uh, given at the district level with daclofenac and paracetamol, and that was supplemented at the chest department with tramadol. Next slide, please. And uh, so far as the psychosocial aspects are concerned, the, this patient, the, uh, she's 62 years old in the widow. She brought to this tertiary unit from the remote periphery of rural Bengal by her only son. 
and who happens to be the only earning member of the family that also comprises of three grandchildren and daughter in law so both the patient as well as her son want urgent relief from the sufferings that is two one is the severe pain another one is the respiratory distress so that her son can go home to resume his work and at this point when first we met the patient they were aware of the diagnosis but not aware of the prognosis of the disease next slide please so the at present when we first met the patient main concern is the urgent relief from pain and respiratory distress and the financial stress the stoppage of earnings so the case summary is 62 year old lady from rural bengal a known case of stage 4 nsclc attends one tertiary care institute presenting with severe pain upper chest due to bone erosion and respiratory distress due to impending sbco uh should i stop here for the discussion uh, in the uh, platform or uh, continue with the management from our part uh, what we are giving to this patient maybe we can uh, just uh, stop here and ask others and then after that we can go on uh, and see what you have done in your setting is that okay, okay. doctor the just so that we get to hear okay. from everyone okay. ah okay 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 so we'll wait for so your that chat, discussion uh, uh, from others yeah um, okay about this discussion spo- discussion points wonderful questions and discussion points mm-hmm. dr devashish uh, like what all can be de- delivered or mode of delivery for this kind of relief mm-hmm. symptoms and how to talk about the prognosis and further management yeah and again yeah. Uh, mobility what wonderful discussion points dr devashish i would like to hear from others um yeah so there are a few chats coming up uh, palliative rt to bone mets uh, with analgesic dr roshan is telling analgesic escalation with adjuvants steroids pal- palliative rt um to the primary including the bone erosion dr parul is telling about speak with the patient and son palliative rt can be advised uh, and ask what they actually know regarding the status i think for the pain management probably she is suggesting morphine any any other comments from others so what kind of palliative care he has asked what is the mode of palliative care to be provided and the type uh, any any comments on that should I, should i uh, say uh, sir you you can you can uh, proceed with your what you have you have done from you okay actually at this point some questions come to our mind that what will be our approach number one uh, whether the sbco is the emergency number two uh, what should be the pain management and number three what should be, uh, is there any tum- direct tumor directed therapy should be initiated now so far as the sbco is concerned as uh, dr josna madam has uh, beautifully depicted that if we go through the sbco only per se it is not an emergency at this point because according to the anatomical classification it uh, we can put it uh, around two according to the clinical use classification it will be in grade two the moderate uh, moderate variety with some amount of functional impairment but here we are uh, dealing with a patient of nsclc stage 4 with pain in totality and actually here the pain in totality means the physical pain includes somatic neuropathic uh, and along with there is the psychosocial aspect is there the patient is very much anxious very much uh, anxious regarding his financial concern patient has respiratory difficulty due to sbco actually here the these two factors increases the pain many a fold 
to uh, according to our uh, perception so uh, in this aspect uh, if we consider uh, all then sbco is a, a real emergency help and we have to uh, give uh, the management of pain as well as sbco simultaneously so we what we have done we uh, started uh, we we actually shipped uh, the patient to our department we started morphine and we started with palliative rt short course 20 gray five perfect fraction because it is an sclc uh, and we get results uh, in three to four days although the uh, uh, pal rt gives his result around uh, after uh, one week but uh, and uh, the patient uh, was not received to any advice uh, uh, when we first talked with them, uh, with her. But as his complaints, as his symptoms subsides uh, slightly, she is now receptive to our advice. In the meantime, what we have done, we talked with uh, the patient's son regarding the prognosis. And when uh, after about one week, when his pain scale has improved a lot, then uh, patient uh, son uh, actually went to his hometown, his home uh, village rather, uh, with much comfort to him, to his family, as well as to his mother. And in the meantime, what we have done, because uh, the, the, the slide is there, and it has a slide of the biopsy report, it is a case. So what we have done, we uh, do the co-guided needle biopsy, and this comes out to be NSLC, but this is favoring adenosia. And with talking, uh, the, uh, the patient's sons came in the meantime, and we uh, talked with patient as well as the patient's son. And they, uh, in the meantime, uh, after 10, 12 uh, days, uh, the patient's physical complaint reduced substantially. And then they said that they will not go further positive, uh, tumor directed chemotherapy at this point, uh, regard uh, after hearing this prognosis. And in the meantime, we get the result of the core guided biopsy report, and which shows that NSCLC favoring adenosia. So some amount of ISC can be done, but because of the financial constraint, we cannot do that. Then we, what we, the available free of cost. See, after 20 days, we release the patient with much comfort regarding the regarding her uh, pain and distress with uh, morphine uh, with uh, morphine as well as the uh, targeted therapy in the form of jefferdinic and with the assurance that the patient's party his son will come after one month and the patient will assure us that she will come after two months and that's it. But uh, till now, is there anything uh, that can be suggested from the audience? Thank you for explaining what uh, you have done and those questions. Uh, we look for some chats. Uh, Connecting them with the uh, social worker near the village is is that a possibility, Doctor Devashish? In no, the area where no, you work? No, 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 no. It is not possible here. Actually, the infrastructure of Kerala is much uh, far better. If the patient is uh, uh, living at Purulia, uh, four hundred kilometer from Kolkata. It is uh, not possible there. Any other suggestions? I think Dr. Indira is also telling it's uh, not possible in your place. Yeah. In any other suggestions? 
phone number in case of emergency or is that it possible is, to connect to the, yes yes, the phone yes that is whenever? that is there that is there because we okay. have made the okay. file each and every patient of a uh, uh, radiation oncology patients have a separate file that is kept in our department with details of the phone number and the address that can be connected uh, what about other participants like uh, in the area where you work uh, is there any suggestions uh, or anything that can be thought to manage this situation it will be great to hear from you all before we have to jules now mm, i understand there are so many at least so many of them who are already working in palliative care or dealing with these kind of situations like dr devashish so it will be wonderful to hear from you all um uh, dr jolsna based on your experience in working in tmh for few years and now with cmc uh, how do you manage this back home other than in kerala situation uh, ma'am are you asking about the patients who are receiving home care and all i did not get the question and uh, uh, we can answer all the questions i came to you towards the end after asking all the participants how uh, dr debashish was asking is there anything more that could have been done in terms of managing the patient at home so dr parul was asking about community based work which is not a possibility in their place so is there anything else in the management that you feel to be added or anything from your side i think if at least uh, if the patient has access to at least a general practitioner that is that a, uh, is that possible there in, in the setting of this patient the, does the patient have an access to a general practitioner yeah that that is possible because the patient was first uh, attended uh, at the local bpsc because we have a very strong triage system from bpsc to shodhar to tertiary ud okay so in in case uh, there is no access to a social worker or a palliative care center where patient is living so what we used to do uh, was uh, just try to contact the general practitioner the patient so we, we used to get the contact number of the patient's uh, nearest physician and before sending the patient of uh, some our hospital if possible if we can connect to the uh, connect to the doctor and you know um, we give a letter and if possible we speak to the doctor regarding the management and what the emergencies can happen and how to manage uh, manage in terms of any crisis uh, in case it happens so i think that is one thing that we can do in patients who do not have access to any other levels of um, palliative care Uh, there is another suggestion uh, by Dr. Parul. Can we we can write on a card do's and don'ts and send them home? Okay, this is a good suggestion. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe some anticipatory symptoms and preparing them for some anticipatory symptoms and medications if possible. Uh, in that. Dr. Devashish, uh, there were other questions uh, which uh, did we take it up or I'm sorry I missed uh, during the chat in between I lost connection also. Uh, actually, were there other uh, questions on pain management that we did not discuss? Actually, we started with morphine uh, uh, when yeah. we shipped our patient to the department. 
and uh, we get results. So when we started, with, uh, actually we simultaneously start morphing as well as PALRT and we are getting, uh, we actually got results from uh, after 72 hours. And then the patient was receptive to our advice uh, after 72 to 96 hours. And after five days, when his uh, complaint subsides a lot, she uh, lets her uh, son to go to the to uh, his hometown to see her family, his family. Uh, was this patient admitted? Uh, actually, we uh, after uh, 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 one month we released the patient with the uh, advice, and we started with the targeted therapy, empirical targeted therapy. She assuming it to be uh, uh, getting the result of adeno CA, uh, assuming it to be uh, molecular uh, yeah. profiling that positive. Another um, thing that uh, we can do in our settings when patients are having limited access to all these facilities are, like we can uh, either admit them for a few days, um, either in the hospital or in a respite facility, uh, with the pur main purpose will be to empower and educate the caregiver in uh, taking care of the patient, and uh, also to prepare them for any emergencies and to educate them about the medication. So that actually uh, helps. So a short admission in either a respite facility or in your hospital, uh, with the main goal will be to educate the caregiver uh, in taking care of the patient uh, and to teach them uh, in dispensing of medications as well as to uh, help them in preparing for any emergencies might help. Actually, the patient was admitted in our department for about one month. And uh, we have given uh, the PALRT during inpatient admission. And after uh, relieving it, we have done the core guided biopsy, get the result, then started uh, give uh, uh, prognosis was explained First, uh, first to the patient's son, then along with patient and patient's son. They decided not to continue with uh, any form of PAL CT. Then we get the result of adeno CA, the uh, subtype of NSCLC. Then we gave the uh, targeted therapy. And we released the patient. Uh, patient was in our uh, in, in patient as our, uh, for about uh, one month. Thank you, Dr. There was a question, two questions uh, about the availability of morphine. For her, morphine supply, we, uh, were you able to manage continuous morphine supply? Yes. So, sir, you are muted. Uh, we have given uh, morphine for one month uh, with proper uh, counseling. And after one month, uh, they assured us that the patient's son will come to, our, uh, come to us. And we'll get another one month morphine as well as the uh, therapy, the targeted therapy, the oral, oral, oral targeted therapy. Wonderful, sir. So there is another question. What is the prognosis or life expectancy of this patient? What do you think will be the life expectancy? Around uh, nine months at most, nine months. It is a stage four NSCLC. Uh, because the patient uh, has NSCLC, favoring adeno CA with SVCO, with rib involvement, with bone involvement, and with liver involvement. So the prognosis is maximum six months to nine months. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing all those information and uh, questions. Uh, Georgina, is there any, any closing summary from your side uh, for this particular presentation? Uh, yes, sir. thank you, ma'am. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Debashish, for a wonderful case discussion. So, uh, the take home point is uh, you should have the understanding of the uh, mechanism, the etiology, pathophysiology of all the emergencies in your mind. So, there are other emergencies as well, apart from these three that we have discussed today. And uh, the difference that a palliative care physician uh, is in what in, in uh, the different, uh, difference in the method in managing, a, managing an emergency is that always you should keep in mind the clinical context, patient preferences, and the family's preferences. 
and always remember to identify those patients who are at risk of emergencies so try to prevent them if possible and reverse reversible causes and also anticipate them and prepare the patient and family to multiple sessions of uh, sensitive uh, conversations so that's it uh, thank you dr rosen i think from Deba, dr devashish presentation also Uh, I think we lost her because of connecting issues. Uh, Shripri, am I audible now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, audible now. I was telling that that uh, Dr. Devashish has covered what uh, Dr. Jolsna was mentioning about understanding the prognosis. I think we lost you again. Okay. So I believe that brings us to the end of another uh, wonderful session for the day. I'm sorry that uh, Dr. Sridevi is uh, facing acute internet issues. And uh, he has left a message with a special thanks to Dr. Debatis for bringing in such a wonderful case presentation for the day very uh, valid case presentation for the day. And thank you, Dr. Josna, for joining us for the evening. And thank you for uh, that brilliant presentation. So I believe that, uh, as usual, this session was also enlightening for many of us. With that positive note, this is Sri Priya, along with Dr. Josna Kuryakos and Dr. Sri Devi Varyal, signing off from the Tips Echo Hub. See you tomorrow with another interesting session and yet another eminent faculty. Till then, everyone, take care. Bye-bye.